Thank you very much, team, and thank you uh, for the invitation to, to be here. Um, and thank you for turning up to listen to me. Um, this isn't a lecture, so you don't need to go to sleep. You can uh, stay awake for this one. Um, what I thought I'd do is just spend uh, 20, 20 minutes or so just talking about um, positive leadership, this kind of topic that Timo teed up for me. And then I'll open it up for Q&A, and you can pretty much take it wherever you want to go. Um, as uh, Timo has identified, I've been, I've been lucky enough to be in Canada for about the last three and a half years, originally from the east, about 3,000 miles east, pretty from the UK originally. Uh, I've been with Microsoft for just coming up to 11 years now, but I've been in the IT industry my entire life. I think I started in this industry in 1986, which is probably before a lot of you guys were born, um, so which is quite disconcerting. But anyway, um, I wanted to start with a story around uh, leadership because I'm going to share with you some philosophies. I'm going to share with you sort of my beliefs around leadership. And I'm going to talk about what I look for with leaders and what I've seen in great leaders that I've been fortunate enough to work with and for. Um, and then you can take the conversation wherever you like. My story is about, when, uh, about leadership being a choice. And when I first kind of occurred to me how powerful leadership could be and what kind of impact, should I stand up here? It'd be easier for you to see me. Um, has anyone heard of um, underwater hockey, the game underwater hockey? So uh, they actually do have a team in Guelph. Uh, I played underwater hockey for a long, long time, and um, I, was, I ended up as the captain of a team in the UK. We were a good team, and we used to go to this tournament every year, which was in Wales, which is where my counterpart is from. Um, and the team that hosted the competition, a team called Neath, they invited teams for one purpose only, which was to embarrass you and win. And they had won this competition year after year. We'd been down there. We'd been beaten a few times. And it was coming up to the the next version of this uh, competition. And normally, in an underwater hockey team, in the kind of national competition, you would have 12 people on your side. It's five people on the water. It's very much similar to ice hockey in terms of it's a very tough sport. You have to rotate your players in and out of the water. And uh, as we prepared for this competition, we had our team together. We could get 10 players together. When it came to getting towards the date of the competition, which was on a, on a weekend, we could only muster five players. So I was the captain of the team, and we sat down with the team, and I had the four other players basically saying, we need to pull out. We, this is crazy. We, we just can't go. You just can't go down and play this game. I really wanted to go, because leading up to this competition, we were the top of the National League, and we had great players with great teamwork. I, I was lucky enough to just be at that time when each of us was in our prime. I really wanted to go. And these guys were like, look, we're just going to go down, we're going to get our heads kicked in, and then we have to drive back embarrassed. And I said, no, I think we can go. I think we can win. We should, why don't we just try it? So anyway, I spent some time convincing him. And eventually, oh, OK, yeah, let's go. So we got in the car, five of us. Normally, this would be kind of a two-car journey. So we'd just pile into one car. We had the bags in the back. I had a station wagon at the time. We drove down to this competition. And to cut a very long story short, we won. We, it was a um, competition of 10 other teams, it's played all day long, multiple games. We won with five players. And I remember driving back in the car with the rest of the team. We went to the, the, the head of reception at the pub. The home team didn't turn up to the reception because they were too embarrassed to turn up this time. And we drove back down. It's a two hour journey from where the competition was. I was driving. The, the other four players had fallen asleep. And we had the trophy propped on top of the bags. So I could see it in the rearview mirror as I'm driving back on my two hour journey. And I just remember thinking, it was the proudest moment of my life up until that point. So I'm 18. I, just, I couldn't believe that we had won. And I've and I, it's, it's, thought about it so often since, about how did that happen? What was the essence of that? Well, we had great players who really appreciated each other. We played different positions. It's, again, like ice hockey, different positions to play, different strengths and weaknesses. I was a winger. I couldn't play in the midfield position to save my life. Um, but... We all had a great respect, and we happened to have the five players who were in their original positions. We had players who had a huge amount of respect for each other, who would not let each other down, and we played the game of our lives. And that was the kind of the, the first, sort of the nucleus of, for me, of leadership. Wow. It just took me to, in, to instill this, like, we can do it. We have, this is the best team we've ever had. Yeah, we haven't all the players. I think we can do it. And it just took that spark and that inspiration to kind of have people re-pivot from, there's no way we can win to. When we won the first game, that was really what started it. We won the first game and said, maybe we could win this competition. So 
the leadership, I think, is very much a choice. And when you start to have those sort of leadership wins, when you see the effects of that, it inspires you to want to do more. So throughout my career, people ask about my sort of career aspirations. It was just uh, up. I just wanted to have more and more control to see how much more I could do, how much more impact I could have. So my orientation was just, I just want to have more control of more things, to have more impact on more people over time. And I went on my journey with some philosophies in mind. Um, one of them was um, crystallized beautifully by my wife only in the last, since I've been in Canada actually, where she bought me a plaque which now hangs in, hangs in my study that says, life is not about finding yourself, life is about creating yourself. And that's kind of how I'm wired. I see my life as a continual opportunity to learn and to teach other people. But the, the day I die is the day that I will stop learning. It's the, that's when I'll have the last opportunity to learn something. And to challenge myself to do new things, to create. Since I've been in Canada, I'd never, I'd been, I've tried my hand at pretty much every sport when I came to Canada. Hockey's a national sport. I'm going to try it. So I started to skate. Now I play twice a week in the league. Terribly, but I play twice a week in the league. Um, because I can. And then the second kind of key philosophy in my mind is that there's always a better way. There's always a better way of doing everything. And that's been my experience in my working career, is there's always a better way. And that I want to work with people who are inspired to think about what is that better way. And being prepared to challenge historical paradigms, things that they may have created. But there's a better way. Yeah, that was the good way back then. Now there's a better way. And trying to find that better way before someone else finds it, which is particularly important in business. So those two sort of two philosophical components kind of drive the way I show up, the way I behave. I'm a half-full guy. Um, and then when I think about leadership and I talk to people about, you know, how, do I, how would I boil it down? There's a be basic belief in my mind that leadership is basically about one thing. It's just about change. And if you think about the leaders, so pick any leader and see if you can decouple that great leader from the change that they were associated with. Some leaders associate with many great changes, others very specific points in time, where the essence of leadership is change, changing the way somebody thinks, changing the way somebody behaves, changing the way somebody shows up, changing the way you're oriented. Being willing to change and being able to drive and motivate changes within organizations or society or everything else. I happen to work in an industry which is completely predicated on change. So the IT industry is, a, is basically an innovate or die business. And in the time I've been in the industry, 23 odd years or so, many companies that were market leaders who were gone, some of names, people like Digital Equipment Corporation, some of you might know, gone. Compact Computer, gone. Uh, WordPerfect, gone. Novell, gone. These are all companies that were market leaders in their particular place, in their particular spaces, but they disappeared because they were not able to innovate. They weren't able to find that better way before the competition they rested on their laurels. They weren't seeking all the time to improve the way that they showed up, the way that things that they could do. And the IT industry is a very fascinating one because it's, it's, um, it's almost an exponential business space in that you have technologies which get layered on top of each other over time. And we're in an interesting inflection point because things are going to change profoundly over the next five years. So things that you're familiar with right now and that you refer to like the TV, in five years and certainly by 10 years, what you see is the TV, that will be gone. The TV will be everywhere. So the TV will be on your mobile phone, the TV will be on your laptop, the TV will be the thing in the corner. And what used to be the TV will just be another computer. So there are some key inflection points that we're now at the beginnings of, two big dimensions of that. One is around the convergence of technology, so TVs being an example, where we're seeing devices converge and technologies converge, so you have more ubiquitous access to different things across your work life and your social life. And the second component that we're going to see evolve rapidly over the next five years is I grew up during an era of IT where um, we saw the growth of the thing called the GUI, the graphical user interface. Now we're moving into an era of something that we like to call internally the NUI, the new user interface, where the new user interface is a much richer experience than graphical. So you're starting to see now the proliferation of touch devices. That's just the beginning. The evolution towards gesture, interactions with computers, and speech, and the migration of computers being devices that are there to um, respond to your commands versus being assistants, so they actually orient themselves in a different way. The next five, 10 year journey is going to be about how we see those things evolve. Now, in the IT industry, because it's predicated on change, 
and there's some unpredictability in there as well in terms of how things evolve and what things catch on, you've got to be constantly vigilant. So the, you've probably heard the phrase, only the paranoid survive. I'm a big sub subscriber to only the paranoid survive. There's always someone out to get you. And particularly in the industry I work in, that's the case. And therefore, you've got to be acutely aware of how things are evolving. And you need to be investing for the long term. Because some of the technologies that are coming to market now are things that were being worked on 10, 20 years ago. And there are technologies in the labs now that will appear in the mainstream in the next 5 to 10, 20 years out. If I sort of drag it back to, back to this leadership question of what does it take, in my, from my perspective, to be a leader and to enable change, if change is the foundation of it, what are the components of that? And I like kind of simple concepts. If I break it down and say, what do I look for? And what have I seen in the great leaders I've been fortunate enough to work for? They exhibit three key characteristics. The first one is they have an inner confidence. Because if you're going to challenge the norm, if you're going to take risks, if you're going to give somebody feedback perhaps they're not, that, that, that they may not enjoy, you have to be willing to put your neck out. And you need an inner confidence that compels you to do that. And the great leaders I've worked with all exhibit a willingness to put themselves out there, to challenge the norm, to challenge the status quo, to challenge the way that people think about things, to challenge themselves, to challenge others. That is a very pivotal and critical component in my opinion, of all the great leaders that I've worked with, and certainly something that I look for when I'm looking for people to join the organization. They have to have that, because in the absence of that, you, will, you won't have the courage, you won't take the risks, you won't challenge the status quo, you won't change anything, because you've got to be prepared to put yourself out there. So that's a pivotal component. The second component is, um, is what I sort of characterize as IQ, but, but I mean that in a pretty broad way because I am a subscriber to the seven kinds of smart. It's not one size fits all, and I've been lucky enough to, again, see many different characteristics of some people are very visual, some people are very numbers driven, some people are very emotionally sensitive. So that IQ component, if you like, is just having enough capacity to be able to look at big problems. So if, again, if you're gonna inspire change, you have to be able to take a step back and consider different options and inputs without always coming to a conclusion. You need to some cognitive dissonance, you need to be able to sort of challenge yourself around assumptions, etc. be prepared to listen, open your mind, and to have things swirling in your mind. That t requires a critical mass, and it requires some skills in order to manage that, if you like. And then the third component is around passion and, and energy. So leadership is hard, and as you guys get into leadership positions and you lead other people, you'll know what I mean. Over time, leadership is hard, whether you're <laughs> sports team captain or whether you're the captain of industry, it's hard, hard decisions to make, hard trade-offs to make. Um, and sometimes driving change can take a lot of energy and it takes a long time. And as a leader, you have to be the one that shows up every day putting energy into the system because people feed off you. So having energy and tenacity, very important. And I've learned that, again, I've worked for large corporations for, I guess, most of my life. I worked for Compaq before I worked for... Uh, for Microsoft for, for eight years. And in big corporations, even more important that you have the tenacity, because there can be a lot of momentum in those organizations. So if you're going to re-pivot the ship, some of those things, they can take a month, two months. I've worked on some projects where they've taken two years to solve something that everybody bought that this thing needed to change, but it took two years of effort. And if we'd taken our foot off the gas, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have happened. So those three characteristics having inner confidence and putting yourself in positions where you, you enable yourself to grow that confidence of like, you can make a difference, you can change things. It just takes one person. My philosophy internally is I want everybody to be willing and able to surface ideas and to put them on the table because then we have choices. We have ideas and perspectives, we have choices. People shy away from that because they think something bad will happen. You never get that choice. As a leader, I want people who can turn up and have the confidence to put those things on the table. I want people who have the uh, intelligence and the tools around the intelligence in order to think about problems in different ways and to challenge themselves and to consider different options. And then I need people who have passion and energy because that's what rubs off on other people in our organization. So if you sort of reprise that stuff, leadership is a choice. You will decide whether you want to be a leader or not. And perhaps not all of you will because leadership is hard. 
in my, from my perspective, a leader needs to be willing to learn all the time. Got to be prepared to adapt, especially in my industry. If I stuck to these historical paradigms, we'd be nowhere because the industry's just too fast moving. You've got to have a willingness to, to acknowledge that leadership is really about change. If the, the essence of that is just it's about driving, motivating, enabling change. And then the three characteristics of having a level of confidence, being willing to um, take on big problems, and then having the passion and energy to actually project that out to people. So I, I thought I would land that, those thoughts with you. And then I think we're going to open up to Q&A. And I'm happy to take any questions on any topic. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Matthew. I'm the senior web designer here at Western, um, and I, so I'm really interested in GUIs and interfaces and interface design. And um, I'm also a really big gaming nerd, um, so I wanted to ask you um, about Project Natal and um, how you see that moving forward with the idea of NUIs um, and how yeah. just your interfaces can control things like that on a larger scale. If you if you go back to you know why do we use computers in the first place. Computers are used to extend the capabilities of human beings. So I can originate something and I can share it broadly. I can do things quick. I can do calculations more quickly. I can, um, I can join processes together to streamline things. So computers are used to extend the capabilities of human beings. And right now, the, I guess the, the last 20 years have been about the primary interface to a computer being the keyboard. So that's our primary interface and then we got the mouse. And then more recently, now we have touch interfaces. Um, but the next real evolution is speech and interacting within a much richer way with things like gestures. So what um, Matthew's referring to is a project we've got coming in this year with something called Project Natal, which is the first manifestation of some of those technologies on the Xbox platform. But those technologies will not be limited to the Xbox. They will start to appear in the workspace. So in the future, when I walk into my office, the computer will sense my presence, and then it will, I can ask it for my appointments that day, and it can communicate with me. I can move through pages just with gesturing. Those things, they're, they're coming this year. You will see that in the gaming environment, but you will see that coming into business much more uh, very soon after that. There, that will completely change the way that we interact. Anyone that's used an IVR recently, an interactive voice response, if you phone up you know, many companies and it says, say yes, or do you want number one, number two, or number three. Those systems are very poor, really. They're just not reliable, like, no, cancel, cancel, especially if you have an English accent in, that, in North America, I can tell you. Um, so there's a way to go, but you can see when that gets solved, a whole range of possibilities open up. And even technologies that I, I wasn't anticipating that I would need, I have now, and I think, how do I ever live without it? So for example, um, we have a latest uh, technology now, right now which translates emails into voice. So I have an email, I'm in the car, I can't read it, but I can listen to it. So I can speak to our server and I can say, read me the email, and it reads me the email. I can originate an email from voice and I can send it in text. So I can decide what the mode is that I want to consume that stuff. We're on the cusp of that proliferating very broadly. Um, and some of the technologies that have prevented us from doing that because it's just been too expensive, again, you will see that things like screen technologies in the next 10 years, uh, you'll have this whole, this whole whiteboard will be touch and interactive. Right now, in the next five years, this technology will be cheaper than a whiteboard. So you can have whole surfaces in your office. You can imagine then, with that kind of proximity, that kind of space, that workspace, how human beings can interact in a much more crisp way. You can exchange a lot more information when you can make it visual and move things around. Um, Science fiction really does inform science reality. Anyone that saw Minority Report, that demonstration, that was built with Microsoft Research. They did that originally. When you see Project Natal, that's that stuff coming to, uh, coming to life. Thank you. Yeah, um, one of the things, again, I think is it's easy to, to miss. Microsoft 
has a very large research um, component. So, and in that research space, which we have centers across the world, including in, uh, in the US and in Cambridge and, and in China and India, those are pure research centers. So the pure research that gets done, they are not guided by our product groups. They're not sort of adjuncts to the office product group. They are pure research. And they look at how computing is going to evolve and how computing can contribute. So a lot of that work right now is focused on in the area of healthcare and the area of uh, augmenting projects around the world to bring our technology to bear. So there's a whole bunch of work which is being done right now in Cambridge on brain research. Um, so the answer is yes. And in fact, if you want to explore that, you can, the, the Microsoft research, the, the way that Microsoft research, uh, the researchers were evaluated, they're, they're evaluated on papers that they publish. So everything that we do in research is published. So you can go onto the Microsoft Research website and you can find lots of information. And if you do find anything that's particularly appealing to you uh, in there and you want to know more about that, then clearly I've got routes to, to help you to get more. So if you, if you are interested in that stuff, then I'd be more than happy to facilitate some connections. Um, that, that they're, they're involved in some fascinating long-range um, projects. Somebody's going to ask me about the iPhone. They're about, they're about to. They're about to. So I was reading the New York Times uh, today, and uh, there was an article by a Microsoft reporter, and he talks a bit about how innovation, he talks about choices on the table, yep. and he talks about the choices that are on the table as not just a, as a tablet, things like that. And he said that the reason why Apple is coming up with these technologies is because Microsoft is, is Yeah, as, how fortuitous. Um, I, I, was, I read the article this morning, and I was talking to Paula on our drive down about that article. Um, the first thing to kind of know is that in any large company, you know, Microsoft has 90,000 employees, you're going to get some friction, you're going to get some fiefdoms, you're going to get some internal politics that can slow you down. And I'd say... That is one of the things working any large company. It was the same when I worked for Compaq. I felt the same. Like, man, how did we get out R&D on this particular area? Um, if you think about um, at any point in time, there's always going to be those, sort of those intentions in, internally. And it can be very frustrating to work for the company. I mean, for example, um, I actually worked for Compaq when we released the first tablet computer, the Compaq Contura. Very cool device. Um, it ran the Microsoft Pen operating system. And... Uh, so the tablet's not new, and you know, in fact, it's not new, and uh, it's going to get a lot better than what we see right now. I'd say that article that, that talked about you know some of the tensions internally actually kind of bringing things to bear. That's true. You know, those things happen, and I think that that era when um, um, I can't remember the name the guy now Bond or Brass, the guy that wrote the article. Um, and that's certainly something, in fact, I was talking to Tima this morning about we're constantly working at trying to break that down because big organizations tend to kind of proliferate politics and everything else. The leaders need to be in there breaking those things back down again because they are the things that can slow you down. And there are some areas I think we're all frustrated that ugh, we have to play catch up. We are playing catch up right now in the mobile space to some extent. I am confident that we're going to catch up. So, yes, you know, we, we have our internal frustrations. If I look in aggregate at the amount of innovation that the company delivers, and you know, I'm in the fortunate position where I get a lot of exposure to a lot of the work we're doing, and a lot of that you, you don't see every day. We have the most innovative um, health information management system on the planet, which is doing some amazing work in hospitals to help people <coughs> surface information and consume it. A lot of that goes missing. I'm fortunate enough to see all the successes. Yeah, there's always some failures in there. We think, man, we could have, we could have been there first. Um, and the, the iPad... That's a particularly frustrating one for me because I've been in the industry, you know, since we had the first device. In my, I had the first device in my hands. That was 15 years ago. And we haven't managed to um, productize that before. To some extent, we have. But that's a good catalyst. You will see a whole range of um, tablet-oriented devices that will come that will feature Microsoft technology and, uh, and Windows. Um, but, we, you know, we lost a bit of the limelight because we were just too slow. That's the truth. Um, I just wanted to refer back to your speech. 
when you were mentioning when you were 18 and uh, you motivated your team to yep. go and, uh, and and I guess win the, win the event. But had it been a case where I guess you it could have been an utter miserable failure. Yeah. And at some point, can you tell us an example of a time where you know everyone else is on board to go ahead and you had to stick your neck out to say this is not good. This isn't what we should do. And, uh, and then how do you determine the point in which you decide not to go and go against the grain in, in, in the opposite sense that you're not motivating them to go, but you're motivating them to stop? Yeah, I think um, it's exactly the same. It's, exactly the, it's made up of exactly the same components. So if you're making any decision in business, you're just weighing up a set of risks. So you're weighing in a separate set of risks in your mind, and then you're going to make a decision. You're going to motivate some behavior based on the conclusions that you come to. So whether it's a decision to weigh up those risks and say, hey, this is the best team we've ever had, and no matter what, we're going to, we're going to play some great games, we could lose. We could have lost. I would have deemed disappointed to lose, but I wouldn't be surprised. I turned up with five players. Everyone else had 12. So you know, that, that decision to go was predicated on my belief that we would show up well and we'd give it a good go. There are other circumstances in, in business where we have, where I've, you know, I've had communities where we've made a decision and then somebody, somebody says, mm, I'm not so sure. And one of the things I try and inspire in everybody that I work with is, if you know something which can contribute to weighting the decision one way or the other, you need to surface it. I get told off for using military analogies, but I'll use them. One of the, one of the ones in the military is, the military has a very robust hierarchy. So you've got a, a series of ranks which kind of dictate what you can and can't say to some extent. And the military works hard to break that down in battlefield conditions because you want to re-pivot re that because the person that's actually facing the enemy has much more information available to, than the guy back at the ranch. So if you know that the command that I just gave to walk across this field and attack that position, you know that this is a minefield. It would be valuable for you to volunteer that information. So what, we, what I try and do with all those decisions is, as a leader, you're just trying to make the best decision you can based on the best available information. What you need is you need people to be willing to contribute that and to contribute their views and then to be able to reconcile that and come to some conclusion. So plenty of situations where I think all the evidence says we should do X, but somebody says, yeah, I'm not so sure. And over time, I think one of the things that, again, I observe and I try and encourage my leaders is if it feels wrong, it probably is. Because more and more over time, your gut over the time you work, it becomes more and more valuable to you. Because if it feels wrong, it probably is. And it's worth even talking about that. Um, so, you know, plenty of situations where I think we, you can be, there can be, you know, two outcomes and you're making just a balance of the risks, that, the balance of risks and the contribution that you have. And as a leader, you just want to try to make sure that you get all of those arguments out so you're making a decision based on the best available information as opposed to um, sending people off when they really never felt they had an opportunity to contribute their thoughts, if that makes sense. Hi there, my name is uh, Dinah, I'm a PhD student here at 5e. Um, I have a question for you about, um, it's actually segues from that, about the um, speech that Bill Gates made at Davos uh, a couple of years ago, where he introduced the idea of creative capitalism. And in that, he suggested that the way forward for Microsoft was to, to take some of that R&D money that they're investing in all these new technologies and expand that to invest in um, just generating ideas on how to solve world issues such as poverty, um, and, and education and in illiteracy and so forth. So my question is actually is, A, is that happening at Microsoft? Because uh, that seemed to be the inclination that he gave at Davos. And second of all, if it, if it is happening, what do those conversations sound like when um, it must be something that is uh, against sort of the, we're difficult, it's a more difficult conversation to say, let's, it's a resource allocation decision, let's spend this money investing on uh, issues of poverty versus you know, new tablets or PCs or GUI interfaces or, or yeah, it's interesting. I remember having a conversation with Bill Gates. Actually, it was, I think it was the first year I was here. I think it was here. Um, where he had a question about, someone asked him, how are you going to, you've been very, you've been very successful, Bill, in your business ventures. How are you going to have the same kind of success in your philanthropic efforts? 
and, um, and why have you chosen these particular areas of focus? And his answer was, I have chosen to spend my time, money, and energy, and investments in those things where there is not a huge amount of commercial value. So some of the world's biggest problems, including malaria and AIDS, for example, they largely affect, or to a, to a large extent, they affect third world countries where there's no money to be had, which is why they don't get the pharmaceutical company spending a lot of money on that stuff. So he felt that there was an opportunity in there to make a contribution where otherwise there is no commercial model, um, which I thought was just a, just a great pivot to start with. And then what he's sought to do is, as a legacy in the sort of Microsoft environment, is encourage the Microsoft constituents, their employees, to participate in that. So there's lots of work we do across the world where every subsidiary, to some extent, can determine where they spend their time and energy, um, depending on what issues are most acute in their country. Um, and also, Microsoft has a, has, a, has a large network of partners that we work with. Where again, we try and sort of encourage a set of behaviors. And then, on the research side, a lot of the work we do on the research side, and there's 3,000 people in that organization, um, that's very much oriented to trying to use technology to solve some of these world health issues. Uh, and it's not intended to make any money. It's all about advancing the science and making contributions in that, in that world. So, you know, at the end of the day, we are a commercial organization, and that's our primary orientation. But I think at our core, the company cares, and that is a legacy of Bill Gates and something that he contributes to contribute. And I think everyone Microsoft employee sees him still as an extension of the company, and we aspire to engender that spirit within our own organization. So we spend a lot of time and energy um, supporting that in every subsidiary. We have a huge volunteering um, uh, approach in our subsidiary, for example, where every employee is, is encouraged to volunteer and put hours and time in into things, as well as their own sort of technology investments that we make. So I think it is, it's part of the culture. It's not really a it's not something that we contend with. We're not, we don't feel we're making big trade-offs because the company across the board, whether it's from research to an individual employee, is encouraged to participate in these, trying to solve some of these problems. And at the macro level, we've got a good advocate for that in terms of, you know, Bill knocks the doors down and everyone else can participate in that. So, uh, my name is I think um, I, I, I like to study leadership, and I've read every book, and apologies to anyone who's read a book, uh, who's written a book um, on this topic, but they're basically they all say the same thing. You know, if leadership is about, uh, the quote I like is, um, leadership is about achieving, the, leadership is the art of achieving more than the science of management says is possible. So getting more out of people than you could otherwise get. So, that's about a human interaction. And there are some key components of that. But if you look at um, the great leaders of our time, very different characters, very different orientations. And as I try and decompose that down to what have they all got, that's why I end up with my, my kind of three themes of like, if I boil it all the way down and I look at the people that I work for, the people I work with, the people I'm lucky enough to, to hire, boil it down, what do they have? That at this ground level, they have this inner confidence. And that inner confidence is something that you develop by putting yourself in situations where you, I can make a difference. What I said made a difference. The way I impacted people, the way I projected my energy to somebody, it made a difference. And then you keep putting yourself in those situations. Absolutely, the principles of leadership can be described. Actually, internalizing how to affect that, they need to be learnt on the job. You need to be experiencing those things and seeing the fruits of your labors in terms of how do I affect them, how do I motivate somebody, how do I get more from somebody. And then there's no one size fits all. Some people um, can just carry people just through the force of the energy and you just want to be with them, you just, you just want to be with them. Other people will convince you through great intellectual argument. So the tools that you use in, a different, in different circumstances, they vary. But if I look at the foundational piece that all of those people are standing on is a willingness 
to put themselves out there, to challenge, and that's kind of predicated on this inner confidence. So I'm always looking to inspire that and build that with the people that I work with. Is just keep building, keep putting yourself in situations that allow you to feel better and better about the possibilities that you have to make a difference to people, to our strategy, to our environment. The tools around that, absolutely, those are things that one can learn in terms of approaches. So I'd always encourage that. But at the end of the day, um, leadership is kind of a, is a, is a learned, uh, is a, it's an sort of experiential, um, it's an experiential learning experience. You want to be continually putting yourself where you can test that. And then you learn over time what works and what doesn't work. Um, so it's absolutely a combination of um, both sort of experiential as well as sort of the academic side. I think there's a few there's a few dimensions. One is that um, just by osmosis, you guys are all going to enter the workforce with a different perspective on technology just to start with, because the things that you're experiencing now, we didn't have them when I started, so there was no email when I started in um, in business. Now that's proliferating. So just the pure exposure to technology in terms of what it does, where it fits in, you kind of pick that up with, through osmosis. The other thing is just making a conscious decision to acknowledge that technology is and will be the most powerful thing you can use in business to affect your productivity um, than anything. So in, in business, there's kind of three big, three big macro levers in my experience. One is access to resources, people, and there are some environments around the world where you can get access to people. Another one is access to capital, and you can see that that has been tested to the limit in the last two years or so. And then the third thing is technology, is the role of technology. And therefore, one needs to make a conscious, a conscious decision to learn about the application of technology and how it can apply to different environments to enable you to be more productive, share ideas better. If we think about, particularly in the Western world, the level of tension that's going to be on um, driving innovation, creating ideas, getting those in production, moving forward, getting more productivity, particularly in countries like Canada where we, we, can't, we can't grow our labor force fast enough. A big opportunity to augment our ability to compete is going to be through technology, but that requires more business people to be more familiar with technology. I have seen over time more and more in the last 20 years IT folks having a seat at the boardroom table you know, 15 years ago, that was not the case. And in fact, I did visit a, a customer in Vancouver about a year ago, first time I'd seen for a long, long time, an IT department that was just a cost center in a back room that reported to the financial controller. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, that's pretty rare now. But I'd say, from a, if you're going to be in business, um, you need to have a familiarity with technology. So you have an additional tool in your armory of things that you can do in order to affect the performance of your company. Um, and I'd be surprised if there wasn't a technology component on the Ivy agenda somewhere. And if you haven't got that, I'd be more than happy to come and participate with some, some more folks who can tell you a little bit about what technology can do. It's very, very important. Um, and sort of my point about it is the biggest single lever. There are businesses that exist today that are purely exist on the back of technology. And technology will be a pivotal component of our country's ability to compete for the long term, the same with other, every other Western developed economy. So comprehending that and how it can play a role and being an advocate of that, I think is very important. Um, hello, my name is uh, Joe Campo. I'm an IS faculty member here. And I hope we taped your last answer, because I'm running that in all my classes. <laughs> And Jillian stole my uh, question about quantum computing. Uh, but the other question I had is, I'm always interested in, especially now, Microsoft is under a lot of pressure from competitors and other issues. What issues or competitors keep you up at night right now? 
you know, so I was rehearsing this question because I don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer yet. And the, the reason is that um, Microsoft works on a very broad front. So at the one end of the spectrum, we're, we're talking to consumers and we're trying to sell you an Xbox, a gaming experience. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, we are trying to replace Oracle in the data center as far as database is concerned and, and everything in between. It's a very broad spectrum. And then in every um, industry, so we have a very specific focus on healthcare, for instance. So if you look at that continuum, the competitors, the interesting thing is we don't have, there's no competitor that looks like Microsoft. There's no one that we can look at and says, hey, they're just lining squarely up against us. You'd say down in the enterprise space, our competitors would be people like Oracle and IBM uh, to some extent. And then at this end of the consumer space, we've got Sony. And then the search space, we've got Google. So there's a range of competitors. Um, so what keeps me up at night, and in fact, I was talking to a group of students earlier, is our biggest strength as a company is that spectrum. And if you take any discrete environment, so as a consumer, I can build you a consumer experience in your home across TV and mobile phone and gaming um, and your PC and the web. I can build you an experience that you can't get anywhere else from any other vendor. You can get pieces of it, buy an iPhone, buy a Mac, um, use Google Gmail. Like, you can have components of it, buy a PS3. You can have components of that, but you can't get the holistic experience. And in the enterprise space, Yep, you can buy a database from Oracle, you can buy a database from us, you can buy virtualization tools from VMware, you can buy from us. If you piece those things together, I can build you an experience that you cannot get anywhere else. And the biggest challenge, and the thing that keeps me awake, is our ability to tell that story. Because our competitors make it difficult for us because they talk about discrete pieces. And if you line up the piece to piece, that's really tough. If I can take the customer back, say, look at this thing more broadly in terms of what my value proposition is, um, then we typically, it's much easier for us to prevail. So the thing that keeps me up at night is, how can I get more people more equipped to tell this story and not just react to the way that our competition plays the game? And in fact, with the theme, we have a group of students who are working with us um, on this particular problem of, in the Canadian markets, how do I help my sellers be able to tell this story more consistently and frame it in a way that the customer can comprehend and that is appealing to them. Um, so I think that's the main thing that keeps me awake. Hi, my name is Jennifer. I'm an HBA student. Um, since we're being hosted by the Center for Building Sustainable Value, I was wondering if you could touch on some of the issues of sustainability that Microsoft is working to address, specifically product lifecycle or any other components that you consider a big priority for you to be working on. Yeah, it's fine too. I was just, again, just uh, this morning just talking to the team about, I think we need to do some work to kind of frame it a bit better because, you know, we're working on many different fronts. So one end of the spectrum, we've got um, a kind of the environmental sustainability components of how we do packaging and everything else. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got um, the sustainability from the point of view of um, our workforce and how our workforce shows up and the participation we have to you know, society in general. So there's a whole continuum of things. And there are some core values which kind of drive our behaviors, which kind of proliferate out from our corporate entity, if you like. And then there's every subsidiary is encouraged to take a stance within their local economy. So you know, we, we want to be a great Canadian company. We aspire to be a great Canadian company. So I spend my time with a lot of other great Canadian companies or other um, companies that have a footprint in this market to really make a contribution to what sustainability means in the Canadian context and what matters to people here and what our priorities are. Because we have a set of unique challenges in this country with regards to you know, our sort of global footprint and the things that we, that we do. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we kind of we tune into that. Um, so across a whole range of different issues. I think we're trying, we're still trying to resolve, and it's one of the things that's on my mind recently. I'm doing something with Paula, and I was mentioning to team this morning, is I want us to get a little bit crisper on where we put our energy. There are some big corp corporate components of that, for, you know, that we will be agents of. So in the future, you won't, you won't buy any kind of packaged piece of software. You'll just download it. So there's a, an environmental component there. But then in terms of our contributions more broadly to sustainability in many different areas. I think we need, to, we need to do some work to resolve where we really participate and how do we bring our best value. Um, 
sometimes we are so oriented to kind of do good, we just do lots of stuff. We do lots of random acts, and I'm not sure that's the most effective way of kind of bringing our weight to bear. Uh, and in fact, I had a follow-up conversation from the, conversa the meeting we were at with um, PwC, where I had a, a great conversation with the president of the PwC. We had a, a real meeting of minds on some common issues, and I said, hey, you know what? Why don't we, get to, why don't we see if we could do some things more jointly? Uh, and rather than us each kind of reinvent the wheel, why don't we see if we can kind of align our efforts? Because we bring different pieces to the, to the party. Um, so I know this is not a, not a clean answer yet, but I think that's because I'm, I'm not, I haven't boiled it down enough yet for our subsidiary to really resolve a really crisp answer. But I can tell you that we're very committed to sustainability and corporate responsibility. We need to do some work to resolve how we best pivot ourselves in there. I would say, you know, in my experience of working with people, and I, I love working with people, and I, part, one of our, our company mission is helping every business and every individual to realize their full potential. And with our managers and our leaders, I spend a lot of time on your job is to focus on every individual in the company and help that individual realize their full potential. And to focus on that, you want to really understand what is it I can do to help that person realize their potential? I can tell you that the most difficult thing to work on is confidence. It's very difficult to, to put confidence into somebody. So really, confidence, inner confidence, it comes from within. What I try and do if I'm trying to encourage people to grow that inner confidence is to keep putting themselves in situations where they can grow a little bit. So if you don't like public speaking, just, let's just get into a group and just have a conversation with Five people. So I can do five people. Okay, okay, now try 20. I can do 20. I can do 100 people. So in a confidence, you can't put it into somebody. It can only grow. And the only way that can grow is by putting yourself into a situation where you can increment it. So that is something that over the time that I've spent, you know, looking at how do I help individuals to grow and to have more impact and to have great careers and realize their potential from a confidence perspective, that's been my sort of resolution is, hmm, what I need to do is I need to help folks to put themselves in situations where I can just increment it. Because can't, you can't go from one day being someone that doesn't have confidence to, woohoo, hey, I'm, let's go, I'm going to present now to 500 people. Like, that's, um, that's something that you have to commit yourself to, and you have to be willing to put yourself into situations where you can just iterate it. And I have been lucky enough to see that happen. I've seen people be able to grow and move themselves from one place to another just by taking baby steps. Well, I don't have any more questions, but since I'm there, what? nobody there to ask you the hardest one, right? <laughs> um, for the IT industry, when you think about sustainability, I think one of the biggest challenges is just the rapid rate of change. Yeah. Product. Everybody wants a new toy. How does a company like Microsoft deal with this tension between this rapid change Yeah, it's, it's very challenging. And in fact, it, it affects every, many aspects of our society. I was with, recently with um, Samsung. And the, the average lifespan now of a digital camcorder, the time it's current on the shelf, is three to six months. So they design it, they put it out in the market, three to six months, something else has superseded it. And we've created an, an environment, particularly in Western culture, where people want the next best thing. So you have this enormous challenge of having to deal with all the energy that goes into creating those things and then all the energy it takes to actually safely dispose of them. Um, that problem is not going away anywhere anytime soon. But what has, what has been changing in order to mitigate that somewhat is the responsible dealing with the end product in a responsible way. So, you know, even up until the last five years, every one of those things just went into a landfill. So all the stuff that got produced and all the nasty chemicals that are used to produce those devices that were just went into a landfill. <laughs> now, 
there are many laws that affect every company around, around this, the, the management of those things when they reach the, the end of their useful life. And also, technology continues to evolve so that they are produced with less harmful um, products, and they're produced in less harmful ways in terms of consumption of energy, etc. But that isn't a problem that's going away anyway as soon. I think the way that the, the world is reorienting itself, particularly the Western developed economies, and we have a leadership role as a, com as a country to be a full participant in trying to solve that problem for the world. But the fundamentals are technology is only going to get more important. So that has consequences downstream to you're going to need to produce more power in order to feed these things that are going to have um, be consumed by all you guys. Um, so we have to think through the whole life cycle in terms of how, how do we originate these devices, how do we feed them, how do we dispose of them uh, in a sustainable way. Um, and that's a combination of both the way that companies approach it, what's socially acceptable, as well as, frankly, some laws that have evolved and will continue to evolve to kind of enforce some behaviors. But um, it's a tough challenge, for sure. Go ahead. No. So um, <clears throat> he said that uh, there are three types of technology. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to see if you ever get three types. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. So he says uh, there three types of technology. The technology that exists when you're born, the technology that uh, is developed up until you're about 30, and the technology that's built after you're 30. Uh, now the first type you take for granted, boring, has Second type, you find very exciting, it's new, you can do all these cool things with it. And the third type scares the living day out of you. <laughs> and so I just want to see uh, what comments you have on uh, your experience and how you cope yeah. with these. I think, I think I'm going to give two perspectives on that because I think it's a great point. One is um, one of the dimensions of why it ended up scaring people, the third category, is because you don't know how to use it, so you feel alienated. That one is going to get mitigated and solved to some extent by the, the new way that we will interact with those things. So in the past, you know, I'm a, you know my mum would use a, would use a PC. And now she has a PC, and now she's, you know, now she's a support burden. But um, she transitioned from being scared of the thing to hands-on, adding value, and now consuming more things. Our ability to do that over time with computers is going to evolve dramatically in the way that we interact with them. So when you can just walk up to technology and it can help you, can you make me a cup of tea, can you do this, can you contact this person, can you send me this email, it changes. So I think the fear factor, the ability for people to interact with computers, that's going to change. The thing that's scaring me right now, though, um, again, I was talking to Paul about this problem, is um, in the physical world, you can see bad things happening. And you can make determinations about, you don't leave your door unlocked. You don't leave your car unlocked. You don't put your name and address on the door. You don't put your mother's maiden name, your addresses of your kids, your dates of birth of your kids on the door. You know what a bad guy looks like. You know what somebody doing shifty stuff looks like. In the world of um, the internet and the cloud, a lot of those things are transparent to people. And what's concerning me right now is people who make who are making uninformed decisions about how they consume and use technology, which is scaring the living daylights out of me because I observe people sharing their entire lives. Like, there is no way that... And then they, I had a great example. I was talking to um, someone that was working with the OPP. The number of people who right now, whose houses get robbed because the bad guys are watching Facebook and somebody count down their vacation. Five, four, three, two, one, robbed. <laughs> Surprise. Like... Um, you know, there's, there, those things, I think one of the things that I always encourage as soon as, in fact, this is a good way to sort of end the thing is you've got to be conscious that the cloud, the world of the cloud, the internet, is a really, really dangerous place with lots of really bad people in who just want to steal your stuff. 
Um, and you've got to get conscious of that in terms of what you share and how you share and just be um, kind of have a buyer beware mentality. Um, that thing is, I think, you know, we're going to go through a transition over the next five years where people are going to look back on things that we're doing now and that you guys are contributing to as well as the, you know, me and everyone else and go, what were we thinking? What were we thinking when we let that happen? And we're going through this transition phase now of how you manage security and passwords. My wife was commenting that now everything that we interact with, of course, is all digital and banking and everything. She's got this list of passwords which she has written down in a book. Um, that, that's a pro we've got to solve that problem. Um, other people, instead of doing that, which is potentially risky, is they just have one password that they use everywhere. Okay, that's another issue. Um, so the thing that's scaring me the most right now is that evolution of as we migrate to the cloud and a lot more of this stuff is transparent is that is not like the physical world but it is fraught with dangers and bad people who are out to do bad things and some of us are making it very easy for them to do that so that's my scary thought for today. <laughs>